Okay, so uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Almighty God, we give thanks that we can meet together today and to study your word and to share some of the truths that you've been revealing to us uh, concerning numbers and concerning chronology. We give thanks for the amazing sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us on the cross and uh, pour con pours contempt in all our pride. And Father, we uh, are nothing without you and we ask that you provide all that we need to represent you upon this here earth, to be filled with your word, help us to accomplish all that you intend for our lives, be merciful to us, forgive us for our sins, and help us to walk before you, uh, pleasing, pleasing you in all that we do and say. We ask your assistance, your presence with us in this here room today as we uh, seek to do, as I seek to present this study, and may those who are listening uh, have a, an understanding heart and a clear mind to understand that which is presented. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this is uh, my eighth presentation on a Bible-based chronological study with a focus on the book of Judges. Um, just as, I'll just touch on something that uh, Theodore was sharing concerning these here right angle triangles. He, uh, he mentioned uh, the Pythagoras dimensions. If you have a three here, and a four, and a, and a five, and the squares and so forth. Uh, if we go to Ezekiel chapter 45, And it's in verse 12. It talks about the money. And it's divided up uh, a number of shekels. And it's, it says it's uh, 20 shekels, um, 25 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your money. I think that's the order that it gives it. And Shekels, there's five, well actually in that sort of context it says uh, 20 geras shall be, I think that's, shall be your shekel. So 20 shekels, 20 geras to a shekel. So 20 times 20 is uh, 400. 20 times 15, I believe, is uh, 300. And 20 times 25 is 500. So we have them dimensions there in, the, uh, in that uh, sort of breaking up of the, the money into in shekels there in Ezekiel 45, verse 12. Also interesting is when we consider the patriarchs, Adam, Seth, Enos, Cainan, and I think it's Maha Lalil. Maha Lil. Maha Lalil. Whatever, I think it's, that's the way it's order. So Adam is 130 when he begets Seth. And Seth is 105 when he begets Enos. And Enos is um, nine, is it 90? When he begets Canaan. And Canaan is, I believe, 70 when he begets uh, Mahalalil. And the difference between 130 and 105 is 
25, the difference between Seth and Enos is 15, and the difference between Enos and Canaan is uh, 20. So it's in a different order than what we get here. So there would be 25, 15, and 20. And in Ezekiel, the order is 20, 25, and 15. So just uh, an observation, which uh, I think is quite interesting, just from what uh, is, uh, Theodore was sharing. So the last presentation uh, was entitled The Book of Judges Chronological Overviews, and it was really focusing on uh, judges and, uh, well, sort of more particularly the, uh, sort of uh, the structure of, well, maybe not structure, but the, the chronology of Othniel. And before that, we had looked at uh, Joshua and the elders who outlived him, which included uh, Phineas and Eleazar, and just some time considerations <coughs> in that there period. I had previously mentioned about 1533 and 977 as a span and a date. <coughs> and we had uh, seen that the first time prophecy, there's 120 years uh, to the flood. And from that there time, it's uh, 1533 years to the two uh, the two golden calves that are set up by Jeroboam, and then you can have 977 years to the Exodus, and the spans there correspond with the dates. But sort of a, another observation just in connection with the number 1533 as well, uh, with that 1533 years. So there we have that span, 1533 years at the top there, going to 977 and you have 120 years either side of that, one to the flood and the others relating to the kings of the United Kingdom. Therefore, after that, you have another period of 391.5 years until Zedekiah is the, being the last king is taken captive to Babylon. And if we take that sort of 1533, and a 391.5 structure. You have that there mirrored when we go to Revelation chapter 9 and we understand how Josiah Litch understood the prophecy of an hour, day, month, and a year, that he had it beginning in July 27th, 1449, and he calculated 391 and half a month. So slight difference, the wrong was half a year but still a still similar connection to the 11th of August, 1840. And then that's followed by a period of 1,533 days to October the 22nd, 1844. And the square root of 1,533 is 39.15. It goes on a bit more, but that's the, the first initial four digits. Uh, just another thing we had looked at was Usher's understanding of the book of uh, Judges. And there was a lot of strange things we noticed in his understanding. Uh, one um, point I just want to talk about is concerning Samson. So his justification for what he does is uh, he has Samson collapse the Temple of Dagon. And then the following year, the Ark is taken by the Philistines. And his logic is that uh, Samson is delivered to the Philistines, who then destroys this temple of Dagon. And then he says, the Israelites, the following year, taking courage, as it seemeth by this great loss of the Philistines, gather together, and there the Israelites lost 4,000 men. And when they had seen that the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh uh, was brought into the camp, then the Philistines... Uh, seeing that all was at stake, sort of encouraged themselves, and then there was a great uh, defeat 
of 30,000 of the Israelites by the Philistines, and then the Ark of God was taken. So he has that immediately after, uh, one year after uh, Samson destroying the uh, Temple of Dagon. Uh, but just uh, if you consider the logic, Samson, Samson actually destroys the Temple of Dagon. And then, then the year later, he's going to have the, the Philistines are going to take that ark and set it up in the Temple of Dagon. So they're going to have to have built that temple uh, the following uh, within the year, you know, and reconstruct everything. So they were quite quick in their construction if that was going to be the case. Another time span that we had looked at was uh, Abimelech. Um, there was from, from the, the end of the 300 years of Judges, 1126, we count it back the, the 18 years of the Philistine and Ammon oppression, then the 22 years for Jair, and then 23 years for uh, Tola, until we get to the three years of Abimelech, where he ruled, and he is made king. And what is interesting there from Abimelech to the end of them, to that 300 years, the end of that period, uh, 66 years. And Abimelech is made king in 1260 BC. And uh, from then you can go 1798 years to the beginning of the 1260. And we can mark there that that's the Antichrist who rules for 1260 years. And his number is 666. So we can see a 666 and a 66 connection there. And then in 1798, we could count 47 inclusive years. We have the three angels' messages occurring at their time and concluding uh, after the period of the second angel is 187 days and concludes on the 10th day of the seventh month when the third angel begins. And 1844 is connected to 2520 years. So this is maybe quite small in this year diagram. But this year can be mirrored. Going back, the, you know, we can count 47 years, the Midianites, and, or 2520 there, of seven years, plus the 40 years of Gideon. So you have 47 years. And then it was 107 years until Ehud died, um, possibly, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, that this, if you're just going to take it as it sounds, which corresponds to the 10th day of the 7th month, at the other end, Mirzat, and then it was 187 years that Ehud uh, begins judging, which corresponds then with the 187 days at the end of that structure. So I just thought, uh, I just sort of came across that, something I'd forgotten about. I just thought I'd uh, include that point before pro uh, progressing. So in this here um, presentation, we're going to look at some uh, time considerations with Samuel and the Philistines. Um, but first of all, we're going to look at the consequence of fitting the generations of Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, into the era of the judges. So Matthew 1, chapter 5, sorry, Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 to 6 says, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, or Rahab, and Boaz, or Boaz, begat Obed, or brother of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. So we have there five generations. So Salmon apparently married Rahab, who had hid the spies in Jericho at the beginning of the 396 six year period from the crossing of the Jordan unto the anointing of Saul. From the fall of Jericho to the birth of David equates to a period of 406 years. As it can be deduced that David was born 10 years after the anointing of Saul. Within these years from Salmon to David, we are given but five generations. It would thus imply that Boaz, Obed and Jesse would have each have to have been, on average, about 125 years old when they became the fathers of the sons identified in their lineage. 
So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 12, emphasizes the old age of Jesse. It says that he had eight sons, and the man went among men, for an old man in the days of Saul. So there's some evidence there that Jesse was certainly an old man. He is still mentioned as alive during the time David slew Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17. So David then would have been uh, certainly in his teenage years. Um, so concerning the lineage of Christ, uh, Matthew chapter 1 verse 8 says, Joram begat Osias, uh, Osias, who is also known as Uzziah or Azariah. In so saying that, Matthew here skips three kings that would follow Joram, namely Ahaziah, Ahazi, Ahaziah, I think, how do you, Ahaziah, Haziah, okay, jo Joash, Amaziah, so they're missing there in that, their chronology in Matthew. So, uh, in saying so, um, so comparing Matthew 1 with 1 Chronicles, 3 verses 11 to 12, we will make the omission apparent. Some commentators suggest that scripture is also bypassing a person or persons between the lineage of Salmon to David. John Wesley did not seem to accept this perspective when he wrote, the providence of God was peculiar, peculiarly uh, shown, in, shown in this, that Salmon, Boaz and Obed must each of them have been near a hundred years old at the birth of his son here recorded. So I have a, a diagram there. So this is the crossing of the River Jordan. And Jericho is going to be destroyed, and Rahab's going to be spared in 1493 BC. So I'm estimating Rahab's age about nine, or sorry, 20. I'm going to get her an, an extra 30 years before Boaz is born. So I'm trying to make it as long as possible. So she would be about 50 when she uh, uh, has Boaz as her, as her son, and then. An estimate of 130 years of the age of Boaz when Obed is born. And then he's going to be 130 years old when Jesse is born. And then you would have Jesse being 116 years when uh, David is born. Just uh, that's uh, sort of the best I can do to fit in that chronology. So just making people aware uh, that uh, these here fathers would have to have been very old uh, for this here. Uh, chronology to work. So some time considerations in the life of Samuel. So uh, maybe Theodore could read that for me, please. Just on the screen. The Lord had commissioned Samuel to give a message of judgment concerning the house of Eli but when 12 years old. We are not told how long before the 300 years of the ark being at Shiloh ended that this commission occurred, but it would be at least two years as confirmed by the following statement. During the years since the Lord first manifested himself to the son of Hannah, Samuel's call to the prophetic office had come to be acknowledged by the whole nation by faithfully delivering the divine warning to the house of Eli painful and trying as the duty had been, Samuel had given proof of his fidelity as Jehovah's messenger. And the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Okay, thank you, Theodore. So here we have Ellen White saying that Samuel was 12 years old 
when God spoke to him and um, he was given a message then to Eli that uh, which talks about their ears tingling and uh, maybe sort of the message of judgment upon Eli and his house because he didn't discipline his sons and uh, Eli accepted it that it was from the Lord but here she says during the years since that there was an acceptance of Samuel being called by the Lord we're not sure how many years so it could be two three four but uh, I'm maybe for instance say let's guess three first uh, Samuel chapter 7 verse 2 tells us while the the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem that the time was long for it was 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented it after the Lord so writing about this here period of 20 years so this here 20 years is occurring after the ark is taken by the Philistines Eli falls from his where he is sitting upon the ground and, and breaks his neck his, uh, when hearing that the, the ark has been taken by the Philistines and then there's a 20 year period from that their time and Ellen White says for 20 years the Hebrews were in the power of the Philistines and they were greatly humbled and repented of their sins Samuel interceded for them and God was again merciful to them and the Philistines made war with them and the Lord again wrought in a miraculous manner for Israel and they overcame their enemies so this war, war occurred when the Israelites had gathered to repent of their wrongdoing and as the fruit of this to invest Samuel as a judge she says with the cooperation of the heads of the tribes a large assembly was gathered at Mizpah here a solemn fast was held with deep humiliation the people confessed their sins and as an evidence of their determination to obey the instructions that they heard they invested Samuel with the authority of a judge the Philistines interpreted this gathering to be a council of war and with a strong force, strong force set out to disperse the Israelites before their plans could be matured she also says this signal victory so what happens here the Lord thunders and and then the Israelites defeat the Philistines as she says this signal victory was gained upon the very field where 20 years before Israel had been smitten before the Philistines the priests slain and the ark of God taken so we have here the same place 20 years different uh, in time with uh, different results so these 20 years followed the 300 years when the ark was at Shiloh and include the seven months that the ark was in Philistia so it says there in 1 Samuel chapter 7 I think that the ark was in Philistia for seven months uh, Samuel's life as a judge from that time is summed up in 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 13 to chapter 8 verse 1 so this is basically from that their time until uh, when Saul is anointed near enough around that time this is all we have it says so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel and the cities of which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life and he went from year to year in Surgut to Bethel Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in those places and his return was to Ramah and there was his house and there he judged Israel and he built an altar 
unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his son judges over Israel. So Ellen White merely state uh, of this period, this year passage, is merely stated by Ellen White as saying, as many years. She says, we are told, we are then told that with advancing years, it became necessary for Samuel to share with others the burden of judicial care. Hence, while he continued to judge the people at Ramah, he appointed his sons to act for him in Bethel and Beersheba. So there's no real defined period. It's just many years. And Samuel is told about being advanced and aged and aged. So it would seem not too long after this year time when he gets his sons to sort of do the work in Bethel and Beersheba that the people clamoured for a king and Saul was thereafter anointed. Yet, although already considered old at that time, Samuel would continue to live until David roamed as a fugitive, fleeing from the murderous pursuits of King Saul, a time approaching 30 years after Saul's anointing. So he is already considered old at that their time, but he's going to live another approaching 30 years after that point. So Sam, Samuel would be a very elderly person when he died. It was seen not too long after this. Okay, I just had to read that. It's just again. Um, so off this year period, we are told that the Philistines still retained possession of some of the hill fortresses in the land of Israel. So this is the time when Samuel's ruling, he's doing the circuit. It's generally a time of peace. But this is just some additional information of this year period. So the Philistines still retained some possession of the hill fortresses in the land of Israel. In faculties, arms, and equipment, the Philistines had great advantage over Israel. During the long period of their oppressive rule, that would be applying to the 40 years that we read about in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, they had endeavoured to strengthen their power by forbidding Israelites to practice the trade of smiths, lest they should make weapons of war. After the conclusion of peace, so that would be at the end of 20 years of 1 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 2, the Israelites had still restored to the Philistine, sorry, the, Phil, the Hebrews had still resorted to the Philistine garrisons for such work as needed to be done. Controlled by the love of ease and the abject spirit induced by long oppression, the men of Israel had, to a great extent, neglected to provide themselves with weapons of war. Bows and slings were used in warfare, and these the Israelites could obtain, but there was none among them who possessed a spear or a sword. So Ellen White here, she's talking about the time of Saul. Uh, so I think only Saul and Jonathan had weapons about that time, so it's sort of reflecting on that uh, past period. Um, so after these 20 years, we're told thereafter, uh, the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Therefore, the period of 20 years was seen to indicate the end of the 40 years of Philistine oppression. So that's relating to Judges 13 verse 1. While Samuel had begun to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Philistines, we could therefore reason that it was God's saving hand after Israel's repentance that wrought their full deliverance. In that scenario, the 20 years of Samson's time as a judge would closely align with the 20 years of 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. We read of the Philistines oppressing Israel in the days of King Saul, so we could understand that all the days of Samuel applies just to the time when he was invested as a judge until the anointing of Saul.
So in understanding that the period from the crossing of the River Jordan until the anointing of Saul is a span of 396 years, of which six years were involved in the taking of the land, uh, then the 300 years of the Ark remaining at Shiloh, being followed by 20 years of further Philistine domination, a period of 70 years then could be accounted for the time that uh, Samuel judged Israel. So I'll just write that on the board, just make it clear. So this is a period of 300 years that Ellen White says the ark was in Shiloh. Prior to this, there were were six years taking the land. This is crossing uh, the River Jordan. And then we have Eli dying and the ark being taken. There's a period there of seven months of the ark being in the land of the Philistines. There's, after that, there's going to be a a 20-year period where the Philistines oppress Israel. And that's going to be ended when Samuel is anointed or invested as a judge. And we've seen that from this year period, the crossing of the Jordan, to the anointing of Saul, who rules for 40 years, is a period of 396 years. Being part of the 480, you have an an additional 84 years here until the the temple has begun to be constructed. We read about that in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So we have six years there, 300 years there, and... um, 20 years there, so that would leave 70 years in that scenario for, for Samuel to do his circuit. And, um, From the time he's how old? So how old is Samuel? When he begins his, yes. his 70 years. So we had seen that. Because it's going to be in the time of Eli, so... Mm-hmm. Yes, so Eli, he dies here, and prior to that, we have an Ellen White quote saying that Samuel was 12. And then we have a mention of a number of years. Now, I, I'm not, I don't think it's too long, maybe about three years, I'm suggesting. Yeah, so he would maybe be about 15 here. For instance, when the ark is taken, or maybe it would be nice if it was 18, and then you'd have the seven months of the Philistine oppression. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, but we're not we're not sure. Okay. Um, say if, if he's 15 here, um, then he's going to be 35 years old. Uh, when he becomes judge. And then he's going to be 105 yeah. when he anoints Saul. Yeah. And then David's going to be born 10 years later. Yeah. He's going to be a fugitive. a fugitive then. He's going to grow up maybe as a teenager, maybe an, an extra 20 years. We're not too sure for certain how long. And then so, so uh, sorry, Samuel is going to die around that time. So maybe he could be about 135 years old, roughly, maybe in that region. Pretty old. Yes. But we had even prior to that, we have Jesse being old, we have Boaz and Obed and we could, we could say that so they're living sort of similar ages, but mm. having sons at that age near enough, you know, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, it would really be difficult to get all of this to work with a lot of the other chronologies. Like, there's always problems. This kind of resolves all the problems. I mean, there's some uncertainty, but no contradictions. Mm -hmm. I think we can get closer than previous times. Yeah. You know, with, we have information that... We have spirit Usher, of prophecy. Yeah, and, and Usher didn't have, or Miller didn't mm -hmm. have. And so, yeah, so we have them two, three hundred years, and there's not much difference between them, you know, in time scale. So um, uh, I think uh, we, we can get quite close. Yeah, so when I deal with Ibs and e, Elon and Abdon in my next study, mm -hmm. if you could just kind of point out where they are, <clears throat> those three judges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. We're going to come to that. In this study? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, okay. Just yes. just before my study yes. on that. So just another point of the chronology. Uh, I'm, within 300 years, this would be 11, 87 BC. And so that would be 20 years and 70 years to 1097. And then you can say that Eli, he had been judged a judge for 40 years, so you can put a, a date roughly when he was born, so that would be 1227, and then he's going to be born 58 years prior to becoming a judge, so he's just at 58, and so he would be born around uh, 1285. And that would be roughly halfway through Gideon's time when he was judging that he would have been born. <coughs> so I have that on the screen there. So we're going to move on now to the 18 years of Philistine and Ammonite oppression and the 40 years of Philistine oppression. So we are told that after Jer died, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Asheroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord, and served him not. So, uh, we are informed that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and uh, he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year, they vexed the children Sorry, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So the focus here is the more the eastern side of Israel, that the Ammonites are going to oppress Israel. Uh, but Ellen White, she gives a wee bit more information. She says the divine judgments followed close on the transgressions of Israel. The Ammonites made war upon them in the east and the Philistines in the west. Other nations also united with these oppression, with these in the oppression of Israel until they seemed again to be shut up, to, sorry, to be shut in by relentless foes. So it's not just the 18 years of the Ammonites and the Philistines. She says there's other nations there. And we had previously read about that they were worshipping the gods of Ammonites and the Philistines. So it also mentions there the gods of Assyria, Sidon, and Moab. So I'm thinking it's those gods, that, the nations that they are serving, uh, that they, they, would be likely be them nations that are, are also included here in what she's saying, other nations. I'm going to ask Theodore, could you read this for me, please? 
Ellen White was later to write, while Israel sorely was sorely harassed by the children of Ammon on the east, the Philistines on the west, the Lord hearkened to the prayers of his people and began to work for their deliverance. After 18 years of oppression, they made war against the Ammonites and effectually destroyed their power. But a backsliding and an idolatrous people soon forgot the lesson which divine wisdom had so often sought to teach them. As they continued to, par to depart from God, he permitted them still to be oppressed by their powerful enemies, the Philistines. For a period of 40 years, the children of Israel were constantly harassed and at times completely subjugated by this cruel and warlike nation. They had mingled with these idolaters, united with them in commerce, in pleasure, and even in worship, and until they seemed to be identified with them in spirit and interest, then these professed friends of Israel became their bitterest enemies and sought by every means to accomplish their destruction. Okay, thank you. So she mentions this period of Ammon and the Philistines in the West oppressing Israel. And then after the Ammonites are defeated and destroying their power, uh, they forget their lessons and God permits them still to be oppressed by the Philistines. And she mentions the 40 year period. So that 18 year period of the Ammonite and Philistine oppression seems to be very closely connected with these here 40, year, 40 years for the oppression of the Philistines. Um, so as she says, and still, what implies that there's no break, that it just continues on. So I'm thinking that these here 18 years um, are within that 40 year period. So there are differing, differing ways that the 18 years and the 40 years could be understood without any definite conclusion. It could be that the 18 years is a portion of the 40 years or a separate period that follows thereafter. That God permitted them still to be oppressed by the Philistines could be seen to support the former suggestion. There is no explicit account of Jephthah or any other deliverer being raised up to defeat the Philistines or the other nations at the conclusion of the 18 years. So Judges 2 verse 18 states that when the Lord raised up a judge, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. In the case of Jephthah, this could be applied to the regions of Israel east of the Jordan. <clears throat> so not all judges, by the way, there's, there is exceptions here. Not all the judge that were raised up delivered Israel out of enemies, because some of them are just says, yes, it, for instance, Elon was a judge 10 years, but doesn't say any uh, person that he's fighting against. <clears throat> uh, Samuel also, soon after Saul had been appointed as Israel's king, spoke to the people saying, Jephthah delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelled safe. <clears throat> so he seems to be speaking, I believe, probably to all Israel, but it seems to me it could be just, you know, it does, in that context, just seems like uh, everywhere, but there is more, uh, there's a wee bit more full to that text. It says, the Lord sent, it actually, it actually says, and the Lord sent Jerubal and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe. <clears throat> so there's four, king, uh, four judges there mentioned. So in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 614, paragraph 4, Ellen White replaces Jerubal and Bedan with Gideon and Barak. <coughs> so, yes. Um, so these passages would suggest, suggest that Jephthah defeated the Amorites. The Israel would have been free from oppression for the following six years, that Jephthah was a judge. On every side would imply that Jephthah had also delivered all Israel from from all her oppressors, including the Philistines in the West, but we have no explicit account of this occurring. <clears throat> and then um, 
This is from Judges chapter 12. You want to read that for me, please? A deliverer was raised up in the person of Jephthah, a Gileadite, who made war upon the Ammonites and effectually destroyed their power, after which Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died Jephthah, and after him Ibzan judged Israel, and he judged Israel seven years, then died Ibzan, and after him Elon judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years, and Elon died, and after him Abdon judged Israel, and he judged Israel. Israel eight years, and Abdon died. Just continue. Judges 13.1 then follows and states, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Note that unlike the previously mentioned judges, the text does not say, And after him, being Abdon, the children of Israel did evil again. Therefore, we cannot simply take it that these 40 years directly followed Abdon, whose death, with the chronology provided, would only would occur 31 years after Jephthah's victory over the Ammonites. In some cases, Gilead is used in the Bible to refer to all the region east of the Jordan River. Gilead is situated in modern-day Jordan. Yeah, so that, that's more applying to the Gileadites. They are mentioned as so like a footnote. Just got out of it. So. Um, and maybe you could read that as well for me, please. In a similar but different quote to that already stated, we are told, while Israel was sorely harassed by the children of Ammon on the east and the Philistines on the west, the Lord hearkened to the prayers of his people and began to work for their deliverance. After 18 years of oppression, they made war against the Ammonites and effectually destroyed their power. But the backsliding, and idolatrous people soon forgot the lesson that divine wisdom had so often sought to teach them. As they continued to, to depart from God, he permitted them still to be oppressed by their powerful enemies, the Philistines. For 40 years, the children of Israel were constantly harassed and at times completely subjugated by this cruel and warlike nation. They had mingled with these idolaters, uniting with them in con commerce and pleasure and even in worship until they seemed to be identified with them in spirit and interest. Then these professed friends became their bitterest enemies and sought by every means to accomplish their destruction. So this is similar to the other statement I read. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's slightly different. Yeah. So in summary, after Israel defeated the Ammonites, they soon apostatized and God allowed the Philistines to still oppress them for a period that would amount to 40 years. So this is relating to the time early in that 40-year period. We're told that there was still in Israel true-hearted men and women whose souls were filled with anguish because of the condition of the people. Their prayers of confession, penitence, and faith ascended without ceasing to God. He was not indifferent to their cries. And while there was no apparent well, maybe I'll just stop here I'll just say because this deals with Samson but um, I'll just sort of put out a wee bit of a timeline from what we had previously read mm -hmm. um, so we have here um, the 18 years this is the, the Philistines and Ammon Um, and then we have six years, uh, Jephthah, and I believe he's then followed by seven years of Ibzan. ten years Elon. And then eight years, Abdon. Mm -hmm. And um, prior to this, you had Jair, uh, 22 years. <coughs> now, if this was also the beginning of 40 years of oppression, so you'd have 18 plus 6 is 
24, plus 7, 31, and another 9. So it would be just ending about this time, just one year before Elon uh, ends his period of judging. So in a sense there, you could have 18, you could even divide that 40 year period. That 18, you'd have 22 there as well. So that would be like 22, 18, followed by 22 there. You could have, see that structure. Mm -hmm. Just noting that. <coughs> now, Elmites, you have here, this year, a period of 300 years, ending here. And the previous Elmite statement, I'd have the 300 years ending, if it's going to be exact, uh, just at this year point, after the one year in, to Ibzan's time of, as a judge following Jephthah. So there you'd have a period going back 300 years as well. And this would have been when Eli dies. <clears throat> um, then you had 20 years after this until Samuel is invested as a judge. Now it would be quite close to then, but it, this would go a bit further. So you'd have, um, that would be six years there, 16, and four years into this period of Abdon. So that's where that would then. So it doesn't quite fit. This would be beyond that period of the Philistine oppression. So for this to fit, you would have to shorten this period of 300 years to say that Ellen White is giving an approximation. Mm -hmm. And she's actually rounding it down by five years. So you have a period there of 295 years. And there's actually a statement by William Miller that we had read earlier on mm -hmm. that mentions that he was sort of complaining that people only give 295 years for a certain period of the judges. And I think that's it. So it just seems to be that sort of a, it does, it is quite similar to this. <clears throat> so if that there was the case, uh, then we can divide this here. Um, period of the 40 years. This is going to be divided in two. And we're going to bring it back to uh, two years into the period of Jephthah. So from there, uh, we're bringing it back five years. One year in the Sibzan, so that would be five. Five years difference there would, in the second year of Jephthah. Mm -hmm. And you'd have 20 years then of the uh, Philistine oppression until uh, Samuel. Samuel. Yeah. And here we'd have Eli, his death, and the ark being taken. And um, so this, yeah, so you mark in like a two year period then from when Jephthah defeats the Ammonites and the Philistines then continue to oppress Israel. And now we've also to add to that Samson. Yeah, so Samson's going to be in that. Mm -hmm. He's going to be born at the beginning of that 40 years. Yes, so we have time to cover this, do we? What time is it? Let me see. You started at, uh, what Half. time did you start at? It's 11.30. Minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. We won't be able to cover Samson completely. Um, 
Well, we, but I'm, you'll do it yeah. in the next study before I do Samson. Well, I think we already did too much of Samson, didn't we? Well, a little bit. But we, had, we had sort of connected him being um, within this 40-year period. So actually, Yes, he's well, in the 40-year period. I believe I can fit it in. Yeah, um, okay. But this year, I'll just read, maybe you just want to read this year's statement. Okay. In summary, after Israel defeated the Ammonites, they soon apostatized, and God allowed the Philistines to still oppress them for a period that would amount to 40 years. Um, there were still in Israel true-hearted men and women whose souls were filled with anguish because of the condition of the people. The prayers of confession, penitence, and faith ascended without ceasing to God. He was not indifferent to their cries, and while there was apparently no response to them, he was preparing help for them. This help would come in the form of Samson. However, during the time of his birth, we are told that in all Israel there was not to be found a man through whom the Lord could work for the deliverance of his people. We had seen that a deliverer was raised up in the person of Jephthah. Therefore, this passage is either relating to a time earlier in the 18 years of oppression or to another period of 40 years after Jephthah's six years as a judge. At this time, the Lord appeared to the wife of Manoah, an Israelite of the tribe of Dan, and told her that she should have a son. And through him, the Lord would begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Okay, thank you. So this year is generally talking about earlier in this year, 40-year period. It talks about them being oppressed. So this oppression by Ammon and the Philistines has taken place. And here we have the birth of Samuel, Samson, sorry. And then he's going to judge for 20 years. Now he's, it says that he began to deliver the children of Israel. That it wasn't complete. So he would destroy uh, the Temple of Dagon uh, around this time. And uh, he would die. Samson dies. And um, so therefore, this period where he judges Israel would begin just before uh, the Ark is taken. So there we have, unlike Usher's viewpoint, we have the, the Ark being taken into the Temple of Dagon. The, the Temple of Dagon is still there. And it's going to be broken. And we're going to put, fix it up and put it together again. And it falls down and it's broken. Um, but it's, the temple's still there, so it's not going to be destroyed until so many years in the teens then uh, after that. So this would be the 20 years of Samson. And uh, it talks about how we had read earlier when we dealt with uh, the chronology of Samson that when he was becoming a mature young man, he then began to sort of interact with the Philistines. So I believe that was just before this year, 20-year period began. Uh, he would have slayed a thousand uh, Philistines with the jawbone of an ass around this time. And he would have talks about the 34 skins or something of uh, the Philistines or something there. And that just maybe just before that. So um, to me, this is, I, I think, maybe the best we can do with the chronology. Where did we put 1260 uh, BC again? We placed so, that. Yeah, so. Um, that was with Tola? Yeah, so you have then 22 years of Jer. Yeah. You have 23 years of Tola. Yeah. And then you have three years of Abimelech. Ah, uh, right. And then that would be 1260. Yeah, it's Abimelech, okay. Okay, thanks. So, in shortening the, uh, so this would be 295 years of the Ark being in Shiloh. This would therefore extend the period of Samuel. To 75 years, being 75 years old when Saul is anointed. So he's going to live more near 140 years. 
In that case, that would be a consequence. So any comments, thoughts? Okay, so we'll close in prayer. Almighty God, we have um, seen your hand throughout history. We have the Bible. We have your accounts of judges being raised up to deliver your people. And uh, they are types of Christ, who seeks to deliver us from our sins, from this here world of idolatry, to a people that uh, do not know you, from them as well, and from our own selves. We have a battle to uh, to be to protect in, and that we ask for uh, that we can be equipped to subdue these here desires which are sinful, keep us from idolatry and those things which Israel fell into, and may we be strong to deliver, not just um, from our own selves, but uh, to help others attain to the, the righteousness of Christ. Um, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.